let's go ahead uh, and introduce you to today's speakers. Uh, I'm going to be kicking things off today. My name is Nick Reichar. I'm a product marketing manager here at Honeycomb. Uh, I'm the guy who decides what words we use when we talk about the uh, technology that uh, we offer. Uh, I am joined by uh, Sasha. Can you introduce yourself? Hey, y'all. I am Sasha. I am a solutions architect here at Honeycomb, and uh, I am essentially here to be a resource for uh, any kind of technical questions that come up on open telemetry or um, anything honeycomb related. Excellent. And Alicia. Hello, I'm Alicia. I'm the manager of uh, product training, onboarding engineering at Honeycomb. So what do I do? I go in parachute and take people where they where they need to go, where zero to hundred anywhere in between using observability, honeycomb and all that fun stuff. So if you have any questions or anything, reach out to me, stuff like that. Right on. Uh, so today we're going to be, it's sort of like, uh, you know, uh, instrumentation fried three ways. Uh, we have uh, a lot of fun showing off all of the cool tricks that you can do in Honeycomb once you have uh, traces getting sent our way. Uh, for a lot of folks, we get the response that they're intimidated by all of the work required to get something like that rolling. And the beautiful thing about instrumenting your applications, your build pipelines, anything in between, is that the process is inherently additive. Uh, it can definitely look intimidating when you're uh, apt to boil the ocean and get like all of the cool bells and whistles working. Uh, but oftentimes, all you need to get started is uh, a little bit of uh, extra code, and you get a lot of bang for your buck. Uh, so the idea today is to look at a few ways to get started with tracing in your environment that are uh, low uplift uh, and kind of give you the foundation to then build on sort of whatever customizations are uh, useful in your world. Uh, and that's going to start with some Node.js instrumentation with yours truly. Um, so the thing that is worth noting here is, uh, as with a number of frameworks, uh, we provide a distribution uh, for auto instrumenting Node.js. Um, the nice thing about this is that you end up getting a lot of uh, stuff into uh, your Honeycomb dashboard very quickly with very minimal config. Uh, simply by sort of adding some boilerplate uh, instrumentation config, you end up getting uh, all the information about the HTTP requests that you're serving, uh, as well as some uh, built-in understanding of various uh, popular frameworks. Uh, we have a few flavors of example apps uh, in our repo, uh, including a vanilla, a vanilla Node.js app and two flavors uh, using uh, the Express framework, one in JavaScript, one in TypeScript. Uh, and we'll be taking a look at a couple of those today. Uh, so with that, and this is going to be a deckware light day as we spend a lot of fun time playing with our code, uh, I'm going to change my screen share. Uh, portion of my screen. I got a few windows I want to show you. Uh, and then we're going to get off to the races here. Um, so I have uh, my own checkout of that same uh, repo we were just looking at, and I've made a few little edits to it so we can kind of uh, look step by step as we get uh, these things instrumented. Uh, I'll start with just that simple hello, hello uh, world app. And when I say simple, I mean simple. All we're doing is setting a variable to hello world and printing that out to the screen, uh, such that if I go in uh, to not node express, but hello node, uh, and I do an NPM start, uh, I can go ahead and confirm. If I hit my local host on port 3000, it does indeed tell me hello world. Uh, now, when it comes to getting this to send some information to Honeycomb, uh, I've uh, taken the liberty of pretty much just copying and pasting uh, the boilerplate that comes from our uh, documentation into a new file, uh, instrumentation.js. All we're doing here is setting uh, a couple of uh, uh, requirements. Uh, we're grabbing the open telemetry node distribution. I've got that added to uh, my dependencies in package.json as well. 
Uh, well, that's my TypeScript DAC, but true in this package.json as well. <laughs> uh, and the only thing I'm going to change is I'm going to have it load that new instrumentation uh, file that I added uh, in addition to index. So that if I go ahead and uh, restart the server here, uh, this time uh, I'll go ahead and set a service name uh, as well. Uh, it will be sending to a data set called hello node on Honeycomb. So that now when I go and I uh, visit this page, I am in addition to getting the page served, of course the zoom window is over my tabs, there we go. Uh, I can go into Honeycomb and I have that a data set matching the, the name I've put in my environment variable there. Uh, and if I look uh, for a count of all of the events that have happened in the last 10 minutes, I should see there's uh, those two times I hit it in my browser. Uh, now, as mentioned, this is a vanilla JavaScript app with not a whole lot going on. Uh, so really all we have here is a root span uh, that is uh, showing us how much time we spent uh, returning that request. Uh, but even here, we end up having, and what we see in these fields here are all of the information that was collected. Uh, so I can see things like, you know, I, I uh, hit this endpoint from Chrome, uh, all of my, you know, headers and the like, uh, as well as things like process ID and things happening uh, under the hood. Still, though, this is not the most exciting trace in the world. So I am also going to take a look at a similar but slightly different app. I'm going to go one directory up and hop into the Hello Node Express uh, project. Uh, and I'm going to run the same uh, thing. I'll just do an NPM start because I believe I've set my hotel service name uh, within that app. So similar uh, thing to before, I've just sort of baked in some of those things ahead of time. So here I should already have uh, instrumentation.js set up in my package JSON, uh, and it is similarly configured. There's not a whole lot uh, different here. Uh, the only big difference in Hello World is that we're uh, using the Express with middleware to serve it. Uh, so the site itself looks pretty much the same. Uh, but if we hop into Honeycomb here and I go into Hello Node Express, you can see I've been doing a little bit of working in this uh, data set. Uh, if I do that same thing, we look at the count of all events in the last 10 minutes, we see a couple of requests that just came in. Uh, and this time there's a little bit more happening. Um, because our distribution has uh, a built-in understanding of uh, various uh, common uh, uh, frameworks, we can see some of the Express-specific things uh, that are getting called out here. So uh, a little more data getting filled out in our trace. Uh, now, usually the sweet spot is uh, taking this and then adding on to it where you might have information within your application that will be useful for you to have access to in these traces as we use all of the various tooling inside of Honeycomb to learn more about what's going on. Uh, and to give you a little bit of a taste of what that might look like, like I have uh, a different branch here. What did I call it? Uh, I think I called it final, all right? I'm very creative with my, my Git naming. I don't want to commit my changes. What did I? Oh, I changed that thing. All right. It's really fun being the demo guy and not having to actually care about my repos because I get to be very glib, uh, which implies I wouldn't be glib if I weren't. And that's not true, but we'll, we'll pretend. Uh, anyway, all right. It lets me switch to, to my branch now without stashing or uh, doing whatever. Uh, and this isn't going to look super different. Let's go ahead and... Uh, Make it a little bit of a surprise. There is uh, a, a slightly different uh, behavior here. Uh, and that is, uh, I have a few uh, different things uh, that this thing can, can say to me uh, that aren't just hello world. So uh, still a very simple app, but uh, a little bit more going on. Uh, and the other thing that's going to be different about this version uh, is that I've got a little bit more going on in my index. So yeah, instead of just setting uh, a single string, I've got an array of possible messages that it picks at random. Uh, I also have a tracer set up. 
Uh, so this is where I am adding some additional instrumentation uh, to what was provided by the distribution uh, to get some more information out of my application. Uh, in this case, because that hello message is no longer static, I might want to capture that as an attribute in my trace uh, so that if there was any problem, this is a pretty simple case, but uh, how many times have you seen an outage caused by unsanitized inputs or any other sorts of things? Whenever there is something that varies, it might be something I want to look into a bit deeper. Uh, also, to make things a little bit more interesting, we've added uh, an arbitrary sleep uh, just so that we can kind of build onto that trace and see more things happening. Uh, so the end result is that if I come back into uh, the same data set and we do that same uh, query we did a moment ago, uh, I should see a bunch of new requests. Uh, and uh, when we take a look at those traces, uh, they're a little bit bigger. Um, so I do see that there is this new, that arbitrary sleep that I added in is reflected here uh, as it was instrumented. Uh, but we can also see that uh, some of these arbitrary things is for the children. I didn't call it out, but there's uh, another, uh, a what do you call, uh, what is it, multi-span attribute uh, where I can go ahead and uh, make sure that any any children of a particular span have a, a particular value uh, put into their dimensions. Uh, but I can also see that this particular trace uh, was when the message was, you say goodbye, but I say hello. Um, and this is where sort of the power of Honeycomb specifically comes into play. Uh, in these traces, I can get a good view of what's going on in any individual request. And through Honeycomb, I can go ahead and take a look at trends, even if they are not easily visible in the aggregate. Uh, for example, here, I can group by that message uh, field that I added. And I can see uh, how those things are distributed, where uh, how many of those requests uh, return, now let's go to the, the results here, the count of each of the potential messages I can get. Uh, you'll notice, though, this is only in uh, the actual uh, span of, um, we hop into one of these traces, uh, the request handler for slash, the thing we're, we're requesting. Uh, and so that message isn't even set earlier in the uh, trace is why we get a little bit of noise here. These 92 unset, is that a problem? Is it not a problem? Well, I only care about uh, the events in which message exists. So I can go ahead and form uh, a query that uh, filters out the, the noise from my signal so I can uh, look at just the distribution of this particular message where it exists. Uh, we end up being able to do a lot of things from here. Uh, I won't uh, go in too deep, uh, but this ends up being sort of uh, the starting off point where uh, from here we can now continue to add uh, more instrumentation or uh, more granular insights into the things that matter most to us. Uh, and do, do, do share that uh, slide deck again. Uh, a, another key thing to note uh, is that uh, this is the newest one of our SDK distributions for Node.js. Uh, we also have uh, Honeycomb authored distributions for Golang, Java, and .NET. Uh, and there are a bunch of uh, OTEL uh, instrumentation options for various other languages. You'll see in our documentation, uh, we give you a, uh, a rundown of how to set up the auto instrumentation and then how to add manual instrumentation in uh, addition. Uh, we also have OTEL collector support, uh, so you end up getting support for a ton of different uh, types of uh, data that you can then import into Honeycomb. Uh, and with that, uh, oh, nope, I have one more thing to share. Uh, so that that was a trace. The one thing it was not is distributed. Uh, we have really a single like monolithic app here, it, you know, silly for a hello world, but it's only work is only happening in one place. Uh, and that not might not be as accurate a depiction of what goes on in your world uh, as you might like to start playing around. Uh, so another thing I'd like to call out is that there is an official open telemetry demo application. Uh, you'll see on the right hand side here is a honeycomb service map uh, that is laying it out. Uh, but it has a dozen or so services written, half a dozen 
dozen or so different languages. So you end up getting uh, a good spread of uh, the types of hotel support there are in the wild. Uh, and there is a honeycomb fork of it. Uh, our very own uh, Pierre is one of the maintainers of this project, and uh, a bunch of honeycomb folks have been contributing to it. Uh, so all of the instrumentation to have it send things to honeycomb is uh, there for you to play with. And so I encourage folks uh, that want to go a bit deeper and check that out. Uh, and not what this uh, webinar is about, but I'm the, the the product marketer for it. So I'd be remiss to not point out that while the service map pictured on the right there is an enterprise feature, uh, it is currently available to free and pro accounts uh, to evaluate it since it's the new shiny thing and we want everyone to get a chance to play with it. Uh, and with that, I will go ahead and shut up for a minute and hand things off to our next speaker, Sasha, to dive into some log use case. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Um, so I'm going to share my screen really quickly so I can get these uh, uh, get these slides back up here. All right. There we go. Um, and hopefully y'all are seeing uh, this beautiful slide deck and all we're going to be doing today, all I'm going to be showing how to, how to do today to y'all is if we've got Nginx running as a reverse proxy or as a load balancer or what have you in front of your applications, um, that's a super easy way to get started with Honeycomb. And I whipped up a little Git repo here. All it's doing, I'll hop in here. It's running a simple node server that we've instrumented with Otel. Uh, Nick already showed you how to do it with the Honeycomb distro. I'm doing it the old fashioned way uh, with just a open telemetry node distro. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna run Nginx. I'm just running it as a reverse proxy here. No fancy load balancing going on at the moment. Um, and the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run Honeytail, which is our Honeycomb agent to grab those access logs that Nginx generates and I'm going to send those on to Honeycomb. This is Dockerize, super easy to get started with. And what I'm going to do is do exactly that. So let's hop into my terminal here. I'm already where I need to be. I'm just going to go ahead and Docker Compose up. I'm just going to build that. Boop, boop. And very happily, it's built. With that, I'm going to go ahead and just run a few curl commands. While that's happening, Let's go back and actually look at what's happening here. So Nick already showed you how to instrument a node uh, application. I've got my tracing JS file here. And all I'm doing is initializing that SDK. That's my node SDK right here. I'm configuring it with my service name. You can also do this via an environment variable. Um, and it's really, really easy to do it that way as well. Uh, I have my honeycomb URL that I'm sending the data to. Got my gRPC metadata. All I'm doing is setting those uh, Honeycomb API key headers. And that said, the last thing I'm doing is grabbing those node auto instrumentations. And this is just gonna get me HTTP instrumentation, express auto instrumentation, all of that good stuff. And that's pretty much it. Once I do that, let's hop in back to that packet JSON. And with my start script, all I say is require that tracing JS file when you're running the application. That's it, that's all I do, and my application is instrumented. Now let's hop into the interesting part where I've added that Nginx reverse proxy. First, I'm just gonna go to my Nginx proxy conf configuration, the, conf the conf file here, and a couple of things you'll notice here. So first, I'm proxying requests to that server that I'm running, my node server. The second thing I'm doing is I decided I don't want you know unlimited numbers of curl requests. I don't want bot traffic in my application. So I'm going to rate limit things. I'm going to say, I only want to allow three requests per second because I have a tiny little server. My blog is not that popular. I only, want to I only want to allow these three requests to come through. And if these requests are you know above that three requests per second that are coming through, I want to rate limit and I want to send back some 429s. Pretty straightforward, that's all I'm doing. And I've got my application running, I've run that curl command. So let's hop into Honeycomb to see what's going on. All right, I received my data. All you need is the API key. I'm not gonna show you mine, but once you have that, 
I'm just gonna go search for count just to see what came in. I'm gonna boil this down to the last 10 minutes. And lo and behold, I've got these requests coming in. Looks like 20 requests came in. Is that what I did? Let's go back and see. Yep, I'm doing one curl to my local host. And I'm doing one to my local host slash year endpoint. Cool, that looks good. Let's just see what, you know, what kinds of status codes was I returning? So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna group by status. And while I'm at it, I'm gonna return, I'm gonna go by service name as well. And let's go ahead and run that query. Now, what I'm seeing here is actually my rate limiting was a little too effective. I returned 19 429s and only one request actually came through. Well, that kind of sucks. What if my blog is actually really popular? Maybe I don't want to rate limit that hard. So one other thing we're going to do, let's hop back right here. And one thing we're going to do here, I'm going to go to my Nginx conf. I've got my fancy little log format here. One thing I'm sending is request ID. Now, when I send this request ID to my access logs, I can also, with Honeytail, define, hey, this is my Nginx configuration for the access logs. This is my log format. Grab that request ID and send that on as well. And in my actual node application, let's go ahead and see if we can pull that up. And in my actual node application right here, nodeyear.js, I can add that as an attribute. So I can pass on that request ID that's coming in from Nginx to my node application. So when I hop back right here to Honeycomb, I know that I've got request ID coming in, that high cardinality data is gonna actually show me which specific request actually got denied. So let's go ahead and run that query. And I can see here, I've got you know, all of these 429s. I can see which requests actually made it through to my tracing demo application. And I can also go ahead, order by, let's say, I'm gonna just do status ascending. So I see that 200 right up top and I see all of the 429s below and I can see what's going on. Now, let's say I was coming in here not knowing about that Nginx con, not knowing about those rate limits. I'm just another developer who got brought onto this project and I'm just trying to see, well, why am I returning all these 429s? What the heck is going on? What I can do is when I run this query, I see all these 429s. I can actually go ahead right from here. I can say, all right, well, just show me what's going on for this request. And I can see it's, in, it's coming in from my Nginx logs. I can hop into the raw data. And I can see right away exactly what's happening. It's coming in from my Nginx log. Something is up with my rules that's actually returning that 429. And that's, that's all I got for you. With those request IDs, you're passing along with pretty much any custom field that you're building in to your Nginx logs being passed along. You can see if there's any issues happening actually on that reverse proxy end or that load balancer end that are having issues. So things like those remote addresses that you will also see coming in from your Nginx logs, you can see if there's a particular instance or if there's a particular you know, server that's having an issue or anything like that as well. And with that, I will stop sharing and kick it back over to Alicia. I attempted to press the share button and I think it shared for like 45 seconds and then went away. Boom. Okay, I'm back. So um, I guess I'm the last one to go. And so I'm going to talk about build events today. And so I'm going to talk about build events based on GitHub Actions and using Node.js um, in that process. So um, just for clarification, you can use any CI provider. I'm just using GitHub Actions. So what is build events, right? So it's the distributed tracing for your build pipelines. And so it's the simplest way to think about it is a series of interconnected interconnect logs, if you look at it this way, which uh, each trace is uh, basically calling out that unit of work. And in this case, the build. And so in one build, you're going to see the entire record. So that's going to be the parent. Um, 
And in that, uh, it's going to show you everything that's happening. And everything after that, the subsequent steps are going to be like the child's steps. And so if you look at it this way, uh, what Sasha and Nick showed you before, you're going to get that same viewpoint, but you're going to get that in build events. The cool part about that is not only are we able to see our bills, so traditional things like, oh, this was successful or this failed, but we can also see other stuff. You can see whatever you want to you can see whatever you want to see and have it as detailed as possible. So you can have high cardinality data in each span. You can have um, details on what you ran on the command line. Um, it's totally up to you on how you want that to work out. So now I'm going to dive right into the code and show you how it works. And kind of talk through a little bit of the methodologies there. And so using GitHub Actions, I'm actually pointing to the one that we maintain here. And in doing that, um, it's going to just watch over the whole, the whole job in itself. And I need to say, hey, um, I want to send it to Honeycomb. Here's my key. And you're going to get your key from the settings, uh, your team settings. And you're going to set that right into your GitHub repository. There is a, a settings a secret section, and you're going to put that right there. And you're going to use uh, build event underscore API key as the actual variable name. Then once you do that, we need to understand where it needs to go. And so you're going to basically tell it the data set. And um, depending on what you're on, so in classic data set, um, but also if you're in ENS, uh, build events will be your effective, your service name there. And so after that, you're going to look at the job status. And so if you think about how um, your pipelines usually work, there are some things that happen, right? So you, you're going to use some things that you cannot control. In this situation, I'm going to use something that I cannot control, which is the start node setup. So that's going to allow the environment to actually bring in some packages for Node that's important to me. And so in doing so, I've said, hey, I want to know, um, I want to know some information around this. And so when this thing actually uh, starts, I want to be able to put some observability around that. And I also want to know when it actually finishes. And so here you're seeing where I'm saying, hey, uh, this thing started and this thing stopped here. And so in that, when you're manually putting these things together, there's a few pieces of information that you need. So you need to know the ID. So that's your unique identifier. With that unique identifier, um, you're going to be able to say, hey, this is the name of my span, essentially. And then we need to know when it starts. And so normally that's, uh, you're going to just say date and it's going to get you that time. And then from there, um, Behind the scenes, we stitch all that up for you. You just need to tell us what you want to do. And so in this case, I'm saying, hey, um, I want to step into this as a trace. And I'm going to use the ID. And so that ID, since we're using GitHub Actions, it's going to be that actual build ID. And then from there, I've said the step ID, the start time, and then step ID. And then from there, um, I'm also stepping into CI. Why? Because I also need to be able to see uh, what's going on in there. And by doing so, I'm able to say, okay, when this runs, how long did it take? That's also important to know because sometimes it builds when we're wiping away our dependencies and putting in new packages, maybe something happened. I don't know, but sometimes those things happen. And then last but not least, in this case, I'm running the test. And so in this test, uh, there's a few things going on. So it's the same pattern um, as said before, but I'm using two additional things. So I'm I'm getting high cardinality data from two different places. And high cardinality data is that custom context that you have. So if you think about it as an attribute or a key and a value. And in this case, I have a build file. And my build file has some key things that are centric to me. Or as you can put it this way, centric to um, this particular project. So I have a team. And so this is my team name. Um, that's custom context that I can query on. So out of all the millions of bills, I probably want to see the one that's applicable to my team name if I'm going in there. Um, code committer, I don't have to do that. I just added that as a field. And then I have a, a, a test file. So I'm using Jest, so I'm just giving it the name. Keep in mind that these are your own, so you can have as many fields as you want. 
And oops, my apologies. And when I run this test, so I'm saying, hey, hi, bill file. This is my bill file. Um, if you don't give it a bill file, we actually create a default one for you. And so you can also inline add um, attributes as well. And so in here, I'm actually doing something inline. So when I run my jest, um, there are some things that happen to where I'm passing some things, I'm failing some things and stuff like that. And so what I'm doing is I'm echoing out those test results because I want to know how many tests ran. And more importantly, I want to know some passed or fail. And so your build pipelines, in this case, my build pipeline um, actually does not, uh, does not fail when my tests fail. And so in this case, I get to understand what's happening, but I could make it that way too. And so no matter how complex or how simple you want things to be, you can put observability around everything. And that's the point here. And so just for uh, full context, um, I have two tests. One is designed to fail because I have a Hello World app. And I have a test um, where the response is supposed to be Hello World, exclamation. One has one, one doesn't, so it's going to fail. And in here, just for the sake of doing stuff, I'm going to basically promote a change, uh, let me clear out my terminal here. I'm gonna change my name just because I can. And let's see here. So I added my last name. I'm just gonna remove. And I was pushing this up to dev. So I'm gonna go ahead and push that right up to dev. And so right from here, we're gonna go here. And I'm going to push the thing. Yeah, dude. All right. So, boom, there it goes right there. So, it's in progress. So, while it's in progress, I will uh, show you around and show you the, the proof of the concept as well. And so, in here, um, What's important to know, there's some things that it's going to kick off. And so build events is actually going to download itself. Um, so you can run uh, basically those commands. And then from there, we're doing a few things like setting up and things like that. And in this case, uh, this is the test that actually ran. And in that test, as I showed you before, I'm actually pulling out information from that log file to get that information back. So I'll go back one and that's still running. So I will click here. And so I'm right now in Honeycomb and I'm in build events because I said, hey, send it to build events and you can name it whatever you want. Um, in this case, I see something that just came in. I'll minimize in on that and I'll go to the specific traces associated with that. So right in here, um, you get to see the span summary. So in here, I'm saying, okay, this is the full trace. And this is actually based on the name associated with GitHub Actions. And then from there, um, this is when I initialized and this is afterwards. And so set up node, as we talked about, um, NPM CI and just test. These are all things that I name. And the good thing about that is that it's, those are things that I can reference. And in here, um, actually in here, you get to see things like, okay, so I had a failed test and I had a pass test and these are my total tests. I can then use that if I want to, to say, Hey, for my team, um, what's passed and what failed and things like that. And so we can go back if we want and say, I'll just say the last two hours here and I can do things, um, where my team name is product training because that's my team. So I wanna see things applicable to my team. And then from there, I can see things like, okay. So I wanna see, um, I wanna see status because that might be important to me because that's coming across. And so in the last two hours, actually I may need to go back. Um, let's see. Do I have any wild statuses in here? Oh, actually I'm not gonna have one based on that. Go back. So I told you before, my pipeline is going to fail. And so I'm not going to have our, it's going to pass. So I'm not going to have um, 
So I'm not going to have uh, many success here and many fails. Um, but in this case, now I get to see, okay, so what failed and probably why. And so in this case, um, from here, I know for a fact, based on what I had before, um, I pushed... I pushed some bad code. Um, I can't see that here because I didn't have any high cardinality data at the time to see that here. Um, but the but this is a way where you can say, hey, not only what is my status, but what is the lay of the land, how well we're doing. Um, you can test things against like latency. So um, these are the these are the interesting things. These are this is the average and things like that because you do have things like your your durations and things like that. If I expand here, yes, <laughs> I, yeah, I am saying that. Click like this. <laughs> I am definitely saying that. And so here I have a duration millisecond, so I can actually see things like average. Duration milliseconds. So I can see in a given time, uh, what is my average? Um, that might be important to know in the case of uh, at some point when I, uh, if I deploy 20 times a day, um, it's different today than it was yesterday. What happened? I'm able to roll back and things like that. And so um, that's, that's build events. And I want to share one more thing. So with our build events, we actually do have walkthrough guides. And so those guides take you through how to set up um, with those particular providers, as well as things like how do you wrap tests around them and things like that. And so instead of uh, going through the high carnality uh, method I did, you can actually wrap the whole test if you want to, to see those individual tests as well. Um, and if you're using something that's not here, you can still use build events. These are just the providers that we have. And so that's all I have. So I guess I will open the floor for questions on any of the things that we talked about today. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, so, well, uh, we were chatting. There were a couple, there was some conversation in chat. Thanks, uh, Alicia and Sasha for grabbing it. But the uh, a question around sort of uh, where the dividing line is between auto instrumentation and manual instrumentation. Uh, and that's a super great call out there is um, in our docs, actually, you'll see uh, the use case that I was showing off uh, is sort of split up into those constituent components so that you can see sort of what information you have at each step. Uh, so it will have kind of the instructions. That's This is the boilerplate I grabbed for the auto instrumentation. Uh, and from there, there are some additional settings you can do if you want to do some sampling, if you want to add metrics to the equation. Uh, we There were a couple of things going on, adding attributes to spans. That was sort of the, the arbitrary data. So even the auto instrumented spans, we can then add further context to if we'd like. Uh, and then sort of the tracer itself is uh, what we're using to create new spans. Uh, and that's where we can sort of add in uh, the extra instrumentation for the things we care about. Uh, it's one of the reasons I love the build events use case, because you end up doing a lot of that building out um, the spans just by the nature of the very regimented build test run uh, setup of doing things that way. Uh, so it translates into a, a fairly universal uh, set of uh, concerns. Uh, speaking of which, as uh, I saw the question, uh, we could find out from build events uh, whether any of our tests are flaky. How might we do that? Oh, there's millions of ways to do that. So, <laughs> uh, one of the ways to do that, um, it, it all depends on your... Uh, I guess, visibility into your test. And so you can actually use a wrapper to wrap around the specific tests. Um, and then after you wrap around the specific test and have that visibility, you can test it against, um, I guess, whatever your threshold is, what you've actually identified uh, with those flaky tests. Uh, from personal experience, um, I had, um, I guess, internal to Honeycomb, we had some tests and there was a test out there that um, was being skipped. Mm. That was important um, because locally it was being skipped. And so I think someone overwrote what we had. And so um, by noticing that the test um, actually identified as 
skipped um, as the status, uh, as the custom attribute, I was able to identify that, okay, this whole situation is flaky because we uh. forcing the forcing the situation. Yeah. No, it was interesting too. There was um uh and last year we had done some uh webinars and blogs with Slack. Um they were an organization that uh ended up using build events to help uh among other things fix their test flakiness. Uh and uh I can't claim to have a deep understanding of the use case, but best as I understand it, it was pretty much just uh them looking for like when are my engineers rerunning the same build. Uh, and that ends up being a, a pretty easy sort of thing to search for. And then uh, once you can isolate that, yeah, I think they said they like had gotten like a 10 X improvement in like their uh, the flakiness of their tests alone, which it's, it's something that like seems simple at the, in the abstract, but like all the time that gets wasted, even like, do I trust my test results or is this just like, oh, I lost network connection for a second. Oops. <laughs> yeah. or you don't have the right amount of coverage or too much coverage. Mm -hmm. There's also, also, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, there's also just the, um, the idea of being able to see back over time rather than just, you know, in your, you know, circle build finished or didn't finish, uh, being able to see back over time, how often that test failed, how often that test passed, and is it consistently failing or is it consistently passing? That's a great way to know, do you just need to go modify your test scenario? Is there, is the data changing? Has something changed there? Um, and that's a great way to find out tests that are maybe outdated or anything like that as well. Yeah. Uh, it's, it ends up being great for like, you know, the, the questions you didn't know you were going to have to ask, uh, another, uh, like the blog, uh, external blog I end up recommending a lot these days are, uh, Vladi Onescu wrote, uh, a blog for us about, uh, using Honeycomb to evaluate, um, container, cloud container, uh, uh, providers. And he was excited because I think at that time, there was new Windows support in uh, ECS. And so he's like, all right, cool, we're going to benchmark this. Uh, and the interesting thing about like his experience was the thing that he expected happened. It's going to be a little bit slower because on, on the average, these Windows images are a little bit bigger. Uh, but it's ended up being slower than he expected. He found out uh, because it was actually downloading the image from Azure rather than caching it locally. Uh, and uh, you reminded me of it, Sasha, because um, the big thing, like, it's always great to see it through someone else's eyes, and I don't necessarily realize what things are differentiating. Uh, but what he ended up doing was using a feature of Honeycomb called derived columns, where you can uh, sort of take information in your instrumentation uh, and build out sort of an interpolated uh, variable from those. So if you have sort of like the start time of each step, say, you can go ahead and subtract two of them and then you have the duration of that step uh and things like that and so uh he had done something similar to isolate just the time being spent pulling an image uh via a derived column uh and then realized that that derived column got applied to all of his historical runs he didn't have to go run a new build uh, because that data is there. Um, it's just the derivation that's new. Uh, he was able to look at the past builds uh, for a parameter he didn't know he was going to need then uh, and get that uh, that same insight, which was, I'm spending too much time downloading this thing. Uh, and it ends up doing the other thing I love, which is he did not know that there was a config variable to cache locally. But just by looking at that behavior, it gave the nudge to go look for it. And that's something where, especially when you're like dipping into the umpteen bajillion cloud uh, services that I'm migrating over to, like that big fear of, oh shit, what is the configuration parameter I'm not gonna know about? Uh, and I love any kind of story where it's like, I find that out intuitively just by kind of doing that, that holistic analysis game with observability. Ah, so many words from Nick Rykar. Um, uh, other uh, questions I'd seen, um, uh, there was a question about sort of what other CI CD tools you could use something like build events with. Uh, and the good news is all of them. Uh, uh, fundamentally, it's a it's a uh, bash script. Uh, so uh, 
any CI solution that uh, lets you run arbitrary scripts, which is pretty much all of them, will let you use build events. Uh, there are some uh, additional niceties for various uh, different frameworks. So uh, the GitHub Actions uh, stuff that Alicia was showing off uh, uh, refines the process a bit, removes some manual steps uh, and things like that. And there are, um, if you'll indulge me with slide sharing mode again for a moment, folks. Yeah, there's uh, the circle CI, yeah. I was tell you the circle CI um, orb, which yeah. is, yeah, is the most events out of them. And then yeah. the Git Lab as well. Yeah. Um, we've got some guides for all three of those. You can find those in our resource source library. If you go to uh, resources in Honeycomb and then just click on guides, uh, there'll be, there are newest things right now. So there'll be the top three up there. Um, uh, we took a look at the hotel stuff. Are there any other things that end of presentation housekeeping? Uh, as far as the log stuff, we saw Nginx, which is one of the many formats Honeytail supports. We do have hotel log support as of a few months ago, and there are docs for that, uh, as well as uh, there is uh, log stash and FluentD uh, guidance in the docs. Uh, and then uh, yeah, I think I, I brought up the SDK distros. Those are the big things I wanted to bring to everyone's attention. Uh, and we would love to hear feedback from you. Uh, so, uh, if you have questions, feel free to throw them in chat. And, uh, if you've got some time, you can complete a survey about this webinar before tomorrow at noon, and we will send you a t-shirt to say thanks. Uh, <laughs> Bethany should be dropping the link in chat, uh, or you can scan the QR code, uh, on the screen right now, uh, or in the on demand, if you lose it when I hit the button like I'm about to do. Oh, animation. There it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, cool. Um, we took a look at some of the other types of logs that Honeytail supports. Um, ah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Any other questions coming through? Nice, nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Lots of talk about uh, uh, derived columns and SLOs in chat, which uh, are some of the things that uh, end up being uh, enticing reasons to keep going on from here. So once you've got things instrumented, you can start building out what are effectively um, sort of uh, monitoring and alerting based on the user experience that your customers are having versus uh, trying to infer that user experience from an aggregated metric. Uh, so when you end up combining sort of that that uh, high cardinality functionality with the ability to go ahead and derive sort of uh, any uh, you know uh, additional data from it, you can basically set thresholds and say you know this many uh, requests are allowed to be this slow over this amount of time. Uh, and if it's less than that, don't tell me about it. If I start burning that real quick and I'm going to run out of budget tomorrow instead of next week, tell me about that. So there's a lot of sort of tuning you can do uh, both to have that alerting uh, be more directly tied to your user experience, but also to give you early insight. Uh, and there ain't nothing better than finding it before your customers do. The other thing I will say with if you are sending log data to Honeycomb or not even just log data, even if you're just, you know, sending open telemetry data from tracing or what have you to Honeycomb um, with drive columns and regex matching, that's a super powerful combo as well. So user agent, you'll, if you hop into the Honeycomb docs, you'll see, you know, just parsing down your user agents. You might have like those funky, really long fields, um, parsing that down to whether it's just coming from Chrome or a particular, I don't know, gaming console or anything like that. I find the regex matching super, super useful and powerful. So just going to throw that out there as well. And you can use that with any other field that's coming into the logs or whatever uh, as well. Uh, and since my brain just went into product pitch mode, if you're a fan of derived columns and haven't been in there in a minute, the, the editor got a whole lot sweeter. Uh, so it does have a, a multi-line uh, adjustable editor with syntax highlighting and live previews. Uh, is purdy. I'm happy about it. <laughs> right. We're nearing the end of our time. Uh, feel free to throw me some any other questions you might have. Uh, 
there, I think, was some uh, just talk about uh, various, you know, APM tools. Uh, how easy is it to start using uh, Honeycomb if you're on tool X, Y, or Z? Uh, and oftentimes, one of the, the reasons that we have uh, uh, supported OTEL as our primary way of getting data in is that not only is it uh, one of the most popular CNCF projects, I think it's the most popular one uh, short of Kubernetes, uh, and uh, it's being used by a lot of providers. So it ends up being a, a vendor agnostic framework uh, that you can use to collect telemetry. Uh, but we also have sort of receivers for various uh, different uh, existing uh, types of uh, APM provider data. Uh, so definitely reach out to us or check out our docs. Uh, there are a lot of ways to dip your toe in the water. Uh, and even if you don't have time to do any of that, there is also a thing called Sandbox uh, you'll find in uh, that same learn area of the website, uh, formerly known as Play. It is a, uh, a live environment that you can go ahead and uh, play around with Honeycomb with no account. You don't need to set anything up. It's all just sort of there for you to play with and learn. Uh, so definitely check that out. Uh, there is a tracing scenario there, and there should be uh, some uh, some new stuff coming there, I think, uh, in the new year. So stay tuned. Well, right on. I'll... Uh... Go ahead and give you a, a peek at what is coming up. Uh, we do have, uh, is that, oh, it's in two days, this Thursday uh, at 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Eastern. We'll have a hands-on intro to observability workshop. Uh, and then later that same day, uh, a session on leveraging service maps with Honeycomb. Uh, so if that little screenshot tease, uh, whet your appetite for it, uh, join us on Thursday to learn more. And I think that's the end of my house coming uh, of my housekeeping. Uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, have a fantastic week, and we'll see you at the next one of these. <laughs>